I am Naya Swami Devi, once again, still. And uh, <laughs> as, as I last saw, and um, we want to welcome all of you to this Sunday morning on behalf of Ananda Sangha here in Pune, on behalf of Ananda Sangha worldwide, and on behalf of our great master, Paramahansa Yogananda, and our line of gurus who have brought such wisdom and light into the world. So, I think the on button keeps slipping. Okay. So, we have a wonderful topic this morning, and we'll try to share some thoughts that may be helpful to you. The topic is how to make the right decisions in life, the right choices in life. And now I know why we let Jyotish go first. <laughs> So this topic, how to make the right choices in life, has two parts to it, really. First is how to know what are the right choices in life. And then the second part is how to have the courage of conviction to act on the right choices in life, which is, in a way, much more difficult. So first, let's start with the first one, how to know what are the right choices to make in life. You know, this age of technology that we live in offers us so many wonderful uh, tools for us to make our life easier. And one, of course, is Google Maps. And uh, you can get directions on anywhere you want to go, can't you? But you have to know where you're going. So you can't just say, okay, Google, take me to, uh, tell me which way to turn. You have to tell them where you want to go. And then they can figure out the route to get there. And so similarly with our own life, if we want to figure out how to make the right choices, we need to understand where we want to go in our life. And if we are contented to live a life that is just on a, uh, getting and building, acquiring things in this world, then we will make certain choices. But if we are trying to direct our life in such a way that we are looking for higher purpose in our life, inner contentment and satisfaction, then we make other choices in life, don't we? I saw a beautiful quote recently from the Dalai Lama, in which he said, he says, I so admire him. He has such wisdom and simplicity in his words. He said, people are meant to be loved, and things are meant to be used. The problem with the world today is that things are loved, and people are used. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. And so if we want to look at our life, where do we want to go? Do we want to just acquire more and more things and thinking, well, this car didn't make me happy, but maybe if I would get just one a little bit bigger, that's what will do it. And so on and so on it goes. Uh, we just heard two beautiful songs composed by our lifelong teacher and direct disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, Swami Kriyananda. Uh, he composed over 450 beautiful pieces of spiritual music. And one of my favorites is one called Life Mantra. The words are very simple. It's a long choral piece with, where the voices intertwine, but the words are simple. It's just, God is life. God is joy, life is God, life is joy. And then it goes on like that with the intertwining over and over, but then it comes to a change in the melody and the words are, um, God who is infinite is joy. God who is infinite is life. Life is a mission from on high, life is a quest for inner joy. And this I want to share with you, friends, for you to consider this, the quest for inner joy 
as a direction in your life. Maybe it's not the prime direction. Maybe you still want to have a good job and earn money to support your family. Of course, these are all good things. But we all have our dharma to fulfill. But if we take those things as the goal and the only goal, we are missing out on the potential to find true and lasting happiness. And so if we take this premise, life is a quest for inner joy, and we start right where we are now. I want to get a better job. That will make me happier. I will be able to provide more comfort for my family. This is a good place to start. But then don't stop there. Keep going. What will really make me happy? To find the joy within myself that is not dependent on any outward thing. And for this, we need to make choices. We need to make choices and evaluate every step along the way. If I make this choice, will this increase my sense of inner peace and inner joy? If I make that choice, how will that do? And so like giving the directions, giving your goal to Google, Google Maps, you give your goal to the cosmic uh, map director, the divine consciousness, and say, Lord, I, my, my ultimate destination is to find your joy within me, and then let all my choices be aligned with that direction. And if, in a way, it becomes so much simpler in that way, because you think, okay, if I lie to a business colleague, Maybe in the short run that works out, but in the long run, I feel diminished inside. It diminishes my sense of inner joy. If I cheat my customers, if I am not kind to my children, on and on, maybe in the short run we, it brings us, if your child is acting terribly and you uh, discipline them, maybe in the short run it makes you feel better. But in the long run, how much better to try to work and give love and support to that child so that they understand what's expected of them and they behave properly. And so, again, it's like, are you wanting uh, the quick so, uh, reaction or the long-term discipline choice of I want all of the choices and turns I make along the way of life Life is a journey, and really every day presents us with choices, and every choice we make can either send us backwards to greater unhappiness and less peace of mind, more uh, anxiety, stress within ourselves, or we make choices that keep us treading water, walking on a treadmill, not really making progress. But if we want to break out into a, the true meaning of life, that where f true fulfillment really lies, then we need to begin making choices that move us in that direction. Well, then we come to the question, how do we have, sometimes we know what we should do, but we, t but we take the easy way out, we take, uh, we do what other people are doing so that we don't stand out. I just finished a book uh, about, it's called The Gift, 10 Lessons for the Modern World from my grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhi never took the easy way out. He never took the predictable way out. But that's why his Satyagraha movement soul force had so much power because every choice he made came from alignment with satya, with truth, with dharma, with right action. And that generates so much power in one's life. And so to have the strength of our convictions, the world will always test us. Don't you want to cheat a little bit? Don't you want to lie a little bit? But if we start making those choices and saying, no, my, my conscience, our, our guru had a wonderful statement. He said, praise does not make me better, 
Blame does not make me worse. I am what I am before my conscience and God. And that's one of our, how we stand in our own, within our own conscience and before God is the most important thing we can do with our lives. Those choices that make us, even if no one sees, if no one sees them. I love the story of, um, there was a sadhu uh, who was very saintly, and he spent many, many years in tapasya and deep meditation. And finally, uh, Krishna appeared to him and said, my beloved child, I will grant you a boon. And the, the saintly man, the sadhu, said, oh, no, I'm not worthy, sir. And he said, no, no, I want to give you one. You have earned it. And he said, very well, then. I wander through the countryside, through the villages, and wherever my shadow goes, wherever it falls, if it touches another person, let that person be healed or blessed or uplifted, but let me never know. And so to live in this world without trying to get recognition, but do it for the sake of rightness, of dharma, right action. And the more we do that, the more freedom we feel. Life becomes simple. It isn't always weighing and balancing. You just feel, what is God's will in my life? Let me do that without questioning. I read a beautiful story about not compromising. Uh, it was took place about, true story, maybe about 10 years ago, in, 15 years ago in China. And it was during a period where the Chinese government was suppressing outside religions. So they were suppressing the Christian churches. And the, uh, an army, a small army, surrounded a congregation that was meeting. And they came in, the soldiers came in with their guns. And they said to the congregation, we want you to denounce Christianity and then Christ. And then we will let you live. And they didn't know what to do. But what the majority of them chose their own life over their beliefs. And so one by one, the soldier said, go and we want you to spit on the Bible, which is like our Gita, it's their sacred book. And one by one, the priests and the ministers and the elders, they all went up and they spat on the Bible. But then there was one young woman and she went up and she said, no, if I do that, my life is not worth living. And she would not do that. And then the soldiers shot her but they shot everyone else as well. And so what is the lesson there? You sacrifice your values, and what do you have in the end? So to, how to make the right choices is in some ways, as I said, more difficult than knowing what they are. But if we can always have what gives us the strength to live the right choices is faith in God, that he will right every wrong, he or she, however you worship God, and two, to have faith in the underlying spiritual principles upon which this world is made. Right action, karma. If I act improperly, it's just going to come right back to me. And the power of dharma, of living in alignment with God's will. And if we can do these things, then this beautiful phrase, life is a quest for inner joy. It isn't just that, okay, I've made these sacrifices, I've made these choices. Your life becomes more rewarding, more fulfilling, more filled with inner joy, and you realize every little sacrifice you made was repaid by, from God's hands with the gold of divine consciousness. So there is ultimately Nothing we can do that is a loss if we're living for God, if we're living for higher principles. And don't, I, I will end with this, and then Jatish will share some specific techniques for making the right choices. But I will end just simply with this thought. Your life is a gift, a divine gift. And there are lessons that you came into this world to learn. Learn them well. And your life at the end will be, you can look back and say, Lord, you gave me a life. You gave me tests. 
You gave me challenges. Some of them I succeeded at, some of them maybe not so well. But nevertheless, this life has been lived with clarity of consciousness and purity of heart, and I feel a great reward, more than the riches of the world could ever bring. So try to find a way that you too can live in this way. Thank you. Well, I want to begin by complimenting all of you on the discrimination to make the right choice, because you're here, you showed up. <laughs> so you at least, at least got that far. You know, I would suggest that making the right choices in life is one of the very, very most important things we can do. It'll determine whether we go to school, whether we graduate, the person we marry, the kind of job where we live, on and on, making the right choices are going to determine the way that we are able to live in this life. But I would also say that probably none of us were ever trained in how to make right choices. Isn't that right? You're probably trained well, I was talking with a young boy yesterday, and he's learning to play tennis. So he's got a coach that's teaching him how to play tennis. He will have much more training in how to play tennis than he ever will in how to make the right choices in life. And we are also that way. We've never been given any kind of comprehensive training uh, of how to make the right choices. Well, that's going to end today. <laughs> so, so I'm <clears throat> the the spiritual teachers show us how to make the right choices. You know, Ananda Moy Ma, the great great saint, said basically somebody asked her, "See, God gives us free will. That's a, both a gift and a curse. But free will forces us to make choices." And so Ananda Moy Ma, one of the disciples, asked her, how much free will do we actually have in life? And she said a very interesting answer. She said, we can choose to move toward God or move away from God. That's the only choice we have. Well, it sounds both stark and probably quite simple, but it's not like one time in our life when we're at optimally functioning, God shows up and says, do you want to move toward me or away from me? And we say, hmm, let me think about that. Toward God or away from God? Toward God or, I'll take toward God. <laughs> well, of course anybody is going to say that. But it isn't done like that. We have, I don't know, I'll pick a number out of the air, a hundred choices a day that move us toward God or away from God. And I'm going to suggest an exercise that you do later on. I'm going to give a little example of it, but I would like you to go through your typical day and see where your choices are. What time did you get up this morning? What time did you choose to get up this morning? That probably depended on what time you chose to get to bed last night and what you did before getting to bed last night. So let's start. What time did you get up this morning? Did you choose when you got up, when you were awake, to acknowledge the day, to say that you're happy to have this day? I had a sister who was severely handicapped by a stroke relatively early in her life. And she had a lot of difficulty in life. But I would often talk with her and I'd say, Mary, how are you doing? And she said, I woke up this morning and I could take another breath. I'm doing great. That sense of gratitude. Uh, so do you greet the day? You, it's a choice. And this choice either moves you toward God or away from God. It's a choice. Are you grateful for the day? Are you thankful for the opportunity to have another chance? Or do you wake up with a negative attitude and a negative response? So 
here we are 30 seconds into your day and you've already made at least two choices that move you toward God or away from God. Then it follows and follows and follows. So do you choose to meditate? Do you choose those of you who follow this path to do the energization exercises? Do you choose when you have breakfast in the morning? Do you choose food that makes you healthy and more sattvic or do you choose tamasic food that brings you down? And so what I would suggest is that you go through almost minute by minute, but at least hour by hour of the day, do this tonight and think about all the steps that you have during the day where you made choices. And those choices, some of them moved you toward God and some of them moved you away from God. What does it mean, moved you toward God? It means expanded your consciousness, expanded your heart so that you're more open, you're more uh, accepting and loving and expansive in life or they contracted you, as Davy said. Did you choose? Probably won't do it today, but at the end of the week, ask yourself, did during this week I choose to do anything that was a dharmic? Did I choose to lie? Did I choose to cheat? Did I choose any a dharmic life, any a dharmic choices? because that's going to take you away. And ultimately, it's not about taking you away from God. It's about taking you away from happiness, from your own inner joy. If life is a quest for inner joy, as David G. said, then the choices we make are the steps along that quest. So you get the idea, but do that. And then once you have that list of your day, Pick out two or three things that you actually will willingly see that you're making the wrong choice and that you want to make other choices and then commit to doing that. And then maybe later on you can pick up another one or two or three. But don't take on everything at the same time because these choices are stuck in old habit. So that moves me to the next point I want to make. How do we normally make choices? And how can we make better choices? Well, there are four ways that we normally make choices. The first is subconscious. This is driven by desires, by impulses, and by old habits. The second is that we make conscious choices. The third is that we make intuitive choices, but kind of based on gut reaction, quick reactions. And the fourth is that we make super conscious choices, which actually are born of the soul's consciousness. So let me go through those quickly. Subconscious choices. It is absolutely shocking how many people, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this, but how many people in this room have made life choices that have been strongly determining in your life without ever really bringing them to a conscious level and making a conscious choice? We were in Italy a little a few months ago talking with this woman who's been a friend of ours for a long time, and she was kind of sharing with us her life has turned out to be kind of unhappy and she was saying well you know this young man and I 20 years ago we were friends and then I don't know all of a sudden we were in a relationship I don't know you know how many people in this world I don't know all of a sudden I was in a relationship now I've got two children and living in a town I don't like and doing a job I'm not very happy with. I love my children, I love my husband, but I there are so many things I didn't make a conscious choice about. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna ask if anybody is in a relationship or that they didn't have very conscious choice about how to get into that, but I suspect there is a, a goodly number we also talked with a doctor here a few years ago. 
he was a wonderful, he, he loved medicine, but when he was a young physician, some friends of his were going to take a test for uh, uh, high civil posts in, in India. He said it's an extremely competitive test, something like a million people take it and 5,000 people are chosen. He was happy being a doctor, but they said, you know, we're, we're gonna go, we're gonna take this test. There's an empty space in the car, why don't you come along? He said, well, okay. <laughs> now, they had all been preparing for months for this test. He hadn't prepared at all. He was the only one out of the group, and one of 5,000 in India, or something like that number, who actually passed the test, and he was given a very high civil service job. When we talked with him, he was in charge of planning the traffic patterns for NCR. And so all of that, you know, very high post. Now it came with a lot of status, good pay, a lot of security, and a lot of misery for him. <laughs> he wanted to be a doctor. And so here's an unconscious choice, an empty space in the car, and the next 20 years are decided because it never came to a conscious choice in his mind. Now I don't want to ask you whether your current occupation is something like that, where you never actually chose to do what you're going to do, that somehow Sometime in the past you got on the subconscious conveyor belt of karma. It's all karmically determined, but you got on that conveyor belt and all of a sudden you ended up in a job that is not very fulfilling for you. Is that, is that a valid way if life is a quest for inner joy? So first of all, we've got to get rid of the, of the, subconscious patterns that don't allow us to even see that we're making a choice. So when you come to a, a one of, you know, we're not talking about what to have at breakfast here. We're talking about something that's going to determine the next 20 years, the next 50 years. If you're coming to one of those crossroads, you'd better slow down and make it really conscious or better yet, super conscious. So then let me move on to the second way. Generally speaking, this is the way, once people are aware that I need to make a, a choice here, that they come to a point at which they come to the conscious mind and they make lists, the possible, the good parts, the bad parts, and all of those lists. Now that doesn't lead to very good choices. One, because the conscious mind is driven by the heart, by likes and dislikes, and most of the choices we make, and then we give the reason for it, were in impulsive decisions, and we give a rationale for it. And I, I read a, a few years ago that the American car companies watched really carefully what it was that made a person choose to buy a vehicle or not to buy a vehicle. And they had cameras and they watched the eyes and they took interviews and all of that. And it turned out that all these lists of positive aspects, the engine size and the gas mileage and all of that, none of it really determined the choice. You know what determined the choice ultimately? Because everything else kind of balanced out so what determined the choice? The number of cup holders. <laughs> That's why you see cars today with two cup holders on this side, two on this side, three in the back, three on the other side in the back. You know, they've overdone it. But nonetheless, see, all of those, those conscious lists of our choices aren't really very helpful because we're still driven by subconscious patterns and subconscious desires. And so, but yet it is very good because reason is a better tool than impulse or, you know, likes and dislikes. Yogananda said that 
so that brings me to the third way that people make choices, and that's semi-intuitively, semi-reasonably, with reason. This means that if you're experienced in some area, you can go in and all of a sudden look at something and just like that, know what's right and know what's wrong. There was a story of a famous um, uh, art gallery, or art museum, in America was thinking of buying this very, very expensive ancient Greek statue. And they brought in an expert to evaluate it. And the first moment the expert looked at it, said, no, that's a fake. But then they didn't want to trust that, so they did all kinds of tests, chemical tests and radiation, and all kinds of things, determined that it was true uh, an actual real statue, so they bought it for some millions of dollars. 20 years later, the technology had improved so that they could test more carefully, and indeed it was a fake. That person who had vast knowledge looked at it and knew instantly that something was off here. Well, a lot of choices that we make are of that nature because we've had experiences driving to work. You'll look at, you'll come out the, on the lane and look at the traffic pattern and all of a sudden feel, I should take this route instead of this route. Well, that's partly experience, partly semi-intuitive. So we make many choices semi-intuitively. Generally speaking, that's a better way if, if you're really aware of it than either um, listing and, and completely rational or subconscious. But there's a higher way yet, and that's a superconscious intuition. The mind with the feelings and the intellect and discrimination is a lower element of functioning. It's what the soul does when it comes into a body. But the soul, which comes from incarnation to incarnation, exists beyond this body, beyond this mind, has its own way of perceiving. And if we can get to the soul power, then we will indeed make the right choices because it is knowing at a deeper level than the mind can know with any of the tools that we have. So how do we get to the soul level? This is where the training in how to make better choices comes in. So how can we make better choices? The first thing is that we should ask because that brings it to a level. We never have a meeting at Ananda without praying and asking for guidance. Yogananda said his highest prayer was, I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right path in everything. So we do have free will. We do have to reason. We do have to make a choice. But to ask for guidance. So always try to stop before you're going to make a decision or ask for guidance. And, and at least ask the divine, the divine within you, your own soul power, ask for guidance and do it consciously, and that will already get you half the way to making better choices. Just asking will be half of the solution. If you can't get it intuitively, then ask those people that you trust what their opinion is, what they think you should do. Now, for those who have opinions, you know, the. Uh, uh, the C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia tales, he had a good line. He said, there are many, many people in this world who would like to serve God, generally speaking, in an advisory capacity. <laughs> Meaning that you're, you're ready to give an opinion on it, just about anything. So if you're an opinion giver, don't give it unless you're asked. That's a, hard, that's a hard line, but Swami Kriyananda was very careful in training us in that way. In, with young children, of course, you have to guide them, but once 
a person has their own free will, their way of soul learning is to make choices, and some of those are bad choices. There was a comedy routine where this wise, the young man and a wiser old man, and the young man comes and he says, you have such good judgment. How do you have such good judgment? And the wise old man says, good judgment, my son, is born of experience. And the young man says, well, how do you get experience? And the old man says, bad judgment. <laughs> Well, don't short-circuit the chance for somebody to have bad judgment unless it's really, really essential. But, but micromanaging hurts you and hurts that other person. Anyway, so coming back. So ask, ask God, ask somebody who you trust and who you trust their wisdom. That's the first step. Then, especially with important choices, Take some time. It's really good with an important choice to get away from your normal environment. Yogananda one time was asked by his sister to help uh, make her mocking husband at least a little bit more spiritual. And he said, well, wait, let's go to Dakshineshwar tomorrow because in that holy environment, he will be more open to the suggestions. It's in the story in the autobiography. You can read it there, Autobiography of a Yogi. Beautiful story. But if you're making an important decision, get away from your normal environment because it has a magnetism that has gotten you stuck right where you are. And if you stay there, you're likely to keep going around in circles, kind of mumbling about the unfairness of life. So break that pattern, get away, go to some place that's holy, take a retreat, go and spend some days. You need to get the heart and the mind a little bit more quiet because God whispers, he doesn't shout. And if you're wanting to get his advice, you have to quit making so much mental noise because you won't be able to hear his whispers. So go someplace that is uplifting and get your mind and your, your heart stilled enough so that you're, you're, you, you won't make the choice just out of the continuing momentum. Then, once you're in a still place, Try to meditate. Meditation is really tuning into your own deeper self. Ultimately, that deeper self is God. But here, you're trying to tune into your own deeper qualities, your soul qualities. And in meditation, don't keep asking the question. Let's say whether to take this job or take this new position or not new position, and you know that it might determine the next 15 or 20 years of your life. Instead of just making subconscious or conscious choices, that's the kind of decision that you want to have deeper intuition on. So if you're now removed from your normal environment, ideally, and you're beginning to calm down and still your heart and mind, then meditate. But meditation is not thinking about whether I'm gonna take this job or not. That is absolutely not meditation. You need to meditate. Meditation is withdrawing your energy, bringing it into the inner consciousness and lifting it up. If you don't know how to meditate, we teach it and you can find it. In fact, I think there's a class going on right after this uh, discourse. So meditate so that your mind is open to the flow of intuition. But as I say, don't just ruminate on the question. Put it on the shelf. And then as your consciousness gets deeper in meditation, then it's as if you can take that question about the job and don't get into mentalizing, but float it up 
floated up into the higher consciousness and the stillness that you have. And if you don't have a lot of pre-existing um, decisions, it's like, oh God, I'm completely open to whether you would like me to take this job or not take this job. But please let me take this job. Please let me take, <laughs> oh God, I'm very open to, you know. So you've got to get a neutral space because in that neutral space, you will begin to hear the whispers. Otherwise, your mind is, is too restless. So meditate, get completely neutral about the choice that you're going to make, float it up into higher consciousness without getting into the mental space. And so now you've, you're still in a higher, deeper state of consciousness, either in or closer to super conscious state where your soul is actually more actively guiding your life. And in that state, then you need to listen. Sometimes you will get a clear understanding in your mind. Sometimes you will get a clear feeling in your heart. Often it comes more with a feeling than with a, with a, a mental uh, aspect to it. But in the quietness of your soul, in the quietness, the stillness of heart, and the stillness of mind, float that and then listen very sensitively because this advice, until you're practiced in it, is going to come very subtly. It's, it's not, going, not often that God will shout it to you. Sometimes it'll come very clearly and very quickly, but, but generally speaking, not. So listen very carefully. If you still don't get the advice that you want, then pose the, the possibilities. Say, God, do you want me to take this job or do you want me to not take this job? And then, generally speaking, you'll have a feeling in your heart if you do that sensitively, yes or no. And then, if you have that, then at least you have some guidance. Otherwise, rely back on the advice of trusted friends or on, on whatever the best decision you can make. Ultimately, if you understand that the real purpose of life is a quest for inner joy, it doesn't matter whether you take that job or you don't take that job. Either way, you're going to learn some lessons, but it matters greatly that Whichever of those you do, you continue this process of opening up to the divine. Because if you want to make better choices, you have to be a better person. That's ultimately what it comes down to. You're a better person as you offer yourself more completely, more openly, more fully to the will of God and then, as Davy said, it's not enough to know what to do. The next step is that you have to do what you feel to do. So act on your intuition. But understand that intuition is not a single end point. It is a series of steps along the way. You know, one of the great problems we have in the world today is that religions argue with each other and fight and kill. Well, the great masters would never argue with each other. So one religion says to its people, you have to go north in order to find God. The next religion says you have to go south in order to find God. Well, if those two groups meet, and start fighting with each other. No, we got to go north. No, we, our religion says south. What God is trying to do is get them both to the equator. And so the great masters don't fight. The disciples, probably if they're good disciples, don't fight. 
It's the followers who lack understanding. So if your intuition pushes you in one direction, then keep asking. Act on that. The more you act on your intuitive guidance, the stronger it will become. But until it's fully developed, then periodically check in. Do you still want me to continue in this job? It seems to be going well. I seem to be. But there, the choice is going to be really, ultimately, it shouldn't be a question of, do you want me to stay in this job? It should be a question, is this job leading me in the way that I want to be led toward my choice, toward my quest for inner joy? And if you keep asking that question, is this bringing me closer to God? Am I being fulfilled through this? You will be guided. So as I'll just close by repeating again, one, your homework assignment is to go through this day and think of all the choice points that you've had. And each of those choice points, ask yourself, did the choice I made bring me closer to God or farther away from God? Did it expand me or did it contract me? So that's your homework assignment. But your life assignment is to reason, will, and act, but ask for higher guidance to guide you in the reason, will, and activity. And if you do that, you will indeed make better choices and you will indeed become a better person. Thank you, Jyotish Ji and Devi Ji. We are now happy to open it up to question and answers. We have a few minutes. So if you would have a question, please raise your hand and one of our volunteers will come around with a microphone. My name is Gagandeep. Uh, my question is that whenever we do uh, intuitive uh, discussion with our own self, and when the question is about our own person or very nearby, near people, uh, our intuitions go very wary. In general, for others, we are, uh, you know, I, I feel that we are, I am more intuitive than for my own self and for my loved ones. So how to distinguish between two? That's a very good question. Did, does everybody hear it or should I repeat it? Okay, I'll repeat just very briefly. Um, intuition flows better for other people than for myself, how to work with that. Um, it's very true because with yourself you're involved, with other people you're an observer. And so if you can truly still your heart and mind, it'll flow equally, but it's hard, hard to do. So sometimes it's helpful to just mentally distance yourself from it. Ask if my brother was faced with this situation or if my a good friend was faced with it, what would I advise him? Would I tell him to take this job or not? And just distancing yourself is also a way that can help uh, make it clearer in your mind. Yes, I, I don't have too much to add. I think that was a good response. But th one of the things that happens through the practice of meditation is you become more objective about yourself. The attachments, the uh, sense of personal identity. Swami Kriyananda defined the ego as a bundle of self-definitions. That's really all it is. And we think, I am this, and I am that, and so forth. And we're very protective of that bundle of self-definitions, aren't we? And so I think for through the practice of meditation, there's a phrase, you enter the watchful state, where you are an observer. And you, in a certain sense, can look at your own life and say, 
um, mm, I made a mistake there and look what happened. Or if I go that way, I can see. It will, it's as though you have a, a bird's eye view of your own life. So the practice of meditation helps a great deal in achieving objectivity so that we can make choices that are not uh, compromised by uh, personal desires and so forth. Okay, Dr. Amar had a question. <coughs> So, I'm afraid this will be the last one because okay. there's a class coming up. So yeah. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for enlightening us on this beautiful subject, how to make right choices. But sometimes, you know, if you feel that your loved ones are making a wrong choice in life, you know, is there a way to help them so that they can avoid uh, suffering in the process? So the question was, um, when you see your loved ones making a wrong choice in life, is there something we can do to help them uh, not enter into a path of suffering? Of course, this is a very good question, and it's uh, something I think we all experience, those of us who uh, have children or family or friends. I, I know in my own life I've seen friends make decisions that brought them great suffering. So there's no easy answer, Dr. Amar, really to this. It depends on the openness of the individual. Our teacher, Swami Kriyananda, said sometimes you would have to wait years to give someone, someone advice because he knew they weren't yet ready to hear it. So I think the best thing to do is to be indirect. If you just say, oh, if you do that, that's a bad choice, what happens? They, we react. We say, well, who are you to tell me this? Uh, especially with children. Um, it's a common practice. But if we can just sort of hint, hmm, a friend of mine did that, and it didn't, saying to maybe your, uh, I don't know, your spouse, a friend of mine went in that direction. It didn't work out so well from them, but you decide. And so at least you can give some gentle nudges in the right direction. And remember too, though, that every single one of us has a different series of karmic lessons and tests. And unfortunately, we can't short circuit those for even our dearest and nearest. Everyone has to learn their own lessons. We can try to uh, muffle the blow, perhaps, but nevertheless, it, you know, just as the gurus try to do, if uh, we hear, read in autobiography of a yogi, how some of the great masters, there's one incidence where the great Babaji uh, picks up a burning brand and lightly touches a disciple on the shoulder, burning him, and the others say, oh, that's terrible. Why did you do that, master? And he said, would you rather have seen him burnt to death as his karma decreed? And so, the, the masters can protect us, so, and that's the last thing I'll say. If you see a loved one moving in the right, wrong direction, pray for the intercession of God that can help them to open their eyes and just they themselves to realize it. I'll add just a, a few thoughts also. Um, one, of course, we have to use common sense. It depends on the age of the child and the experience of the child. If we're here, we're going to talk about uh, our own children. So if you have a three-year-old and that three-year-old thinks it's a really good idea to try to pet a cobra, you don't say, oh, well, he's got to make his own choices. Of course, you step in and, and stop that. But if that child is 15 or 16, and now has developed a lot of life experience and developed a, uh, actually a strong will. In fact, in our schooling system, we talk about the years uh, from, from 12 to 18 as being the will years. That's when the willpower really develops. So in those years, you have to try to guide but not overrule the will. So it would be good, in fact, as children age a little bit, get into 12, 13, in those ages, to help 
train them in how to make good choices. Some of these principles of how to make a, a good choice, uh, if that training is there, then when the impulse just comes, they're more likely to make uh, good and valid choices. So there's also a kind of way that you can kind of be in between these two of not, not, uh, not suppressing, but also not just allowing everything. We had a friend who uh, said that when he took his daughter shopping, he would pick out three dresses, all of which were okay. And then he would say, you choose which dress you want. But he didn't send her into a store and with a hundred choices. And uh, you know, this was a six or eight year old daughter uh, and let her choose. So limit the choices, but still give your children the opportunity to make some choices. So just like growing a muscle, growing the ability to make, to discriminate is something that can be trained. And so gradually train them. Then when it comes to, let's say the expression in America is where the rubber meets the road, you know, the really tough things. So you've got a 16-year-old, and the 16-year-old wants to do something that you think is absolutely crazy. The will is pretty well developed. Or let's say an 18-year-old has finished uh, normal school and has decided that they don't want to go to college or they want to go somewhere, make a choice that you don't approve of at all. You have to balance how dangerous that choice is because you have more experience or how much you're going to take away from your child. So just you have to work with it. And, and maybe in this case you say, well, why don't you take a gap year, which is becoming more popular now, in between you know, what we call high school, so 12th form and college, Take a year away from schooling and maybe get some wider experience, then come and start your college. So find, find compromises that are um, commiserate with the, with the danger involved and the right that this growing soul has to make their own choices. And um, it's never easy. You know, raising children is a art form that uh, nobody has ever perfected, I think. Okay, so I think we will close now because we have some of our monks are going to be offering a how to, free how to meditate class now, and we hope many of you can stay. But thank you for joining us, and we hope that uh, we were able to offer you some of our Guruji's teachings that will prove useful, helpful, and as guidelines for your life as well. <laughs>